Thank you very much indeed. Um, welcome members to the 16th meeting of the 2019 Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Uh, we do have an apology from one of the members of the committee, Maureen Watt, MSP, is unable to be with us. And um, we have Gordon MacDonald joining us as Maureen's substitute. And before we start agenda item one, I'd like to invite Gordon MacDonald, MSP, to declare any relevant interest, please. I have no relevant interest. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. OK, <clears throat> moving on then, agenda item one. And that uh, is the Scottish Elections Franchise and Representation Bill. And um, joining us today, we have Andy Hunter, um, Chair of the Association of Electoral Administrators, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, Sarah McKee, Manager of Electoral Commission Scotland. Uh, Chris Highcock, Secretary of the Electoral Management Board for Scotland, the EMB. And Peter Wildman, who is the Chair of the Electoral Registration Committee Scottish Assessors Association. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome you all to the meeting. Um, because there are four of you and we've got um, a number of questions to go through, we won't be asking for an opening statement as such, um, but do feel free to expand on uh, whatever questions um, you hear uh, and your answers. So it's very nice to see you all here and members of the public who we don't always get a large number at this time in the morning, but pleased to see you all as well. Um, OK, so could we possibly start off with some questions from the committee and Neil, I believe. Um, I'm just look at, looking at the four uh, names on the, and the four of you in front of us uh, and all of the um, organisations that you represent. Um, I know the convener doesn't want opening statements, but there seems to be a hell of a lot of you involved in this very similar field. Um, can you briefly tell us why we need all of you. <laughs> yeah, maybe introduce myself. I'm uh, Electoral Reg Registration Officer for Central Scotland. I'm also Chair of the Electoral Registration Committee of the SAA. That committee comprises the 15 Electoral Registration Officers across Scotland and their senior staff. So we are the stakeholders that actually deliver electoral registration across Scotland. And um, speaking on behalf of the Electoral Commission, um, in relation to the Franchise Bill, our role will be in providing um, guidance and support to electoral registration officers and to the returning officers who will be administering the um, legislation. We will also be in charge of public awareness campaigns to reach those newly enfranchised citizens. So that's our interest in this bill. The Association of Electoral Administrators is a, a, it's a professional body that represents uh, anybody that works in electoral administration right across the UK. There are just under 2,000 uh, members and essentially it's there to help protect and uh, promote good work in the electoral administration field, both in the return officer and the registration side. Hi there, I'm Chris Hike. I'm a deputy return officer in the City of Edinburgh Council. So the return officers are those that are charged with actually the administration of electoral events in Scotland. Um, the Electoral Management Board for Scotland is responsible for coordinating and supporting return officers and electoral registration officers in the delivery of electoral events, promoting best practice, and always making sure that the voters' interests are at the heart of all that return officers and electoral uh, registration officers do. Okay, I feel a flowchart coming on now. Um, could I, could I start by asking um, in relation to the um, number of people who... Uh, but, well, the register initially, um, there's often comments about the inaccuracy of the register. Uh, there's been an estimate that a further 55,000 people would come onto the register through this provision. Um, given the historic problems about accuracy around the register, is that accurate? Uh, and uh, is that projection accurate in your opinion? Projection numbers is taken from the, my understanding is taken from the 2011 census. So there is a degree of, there will have, that number will have changed over the course of time. Um, to put that in context, there are some 4.1 million electors currently registered across Scotland, of which there are 132,000 EU citizens on the electoral register, and that excludes citizens of um, UK, Ireland, Cyprus and Malta because they qualify as Commonwealth citizens or in the case of Ireland as in their own right as Irish citizens. So um, 55,000, it is a, a reasonable number that it will um, take some time to get people onto the register but it's not an, it's not an unmanageable, it is not in that context, it's a manageable number. 
Uh, anybody else want to comment on that? No? Okay. And um, the Electoral Commission uh, data tells us that uh, uh, accuracy of the register has fallen since 2015, now standing at 86% uh, accurate. Um, that's a significant number of people who are not accurately um, picked up on the register. Why is that happening? You will you will find that the register is a, a snapshot at time, um, and uh, at any point it is updated on a monthly basis. But at any point during a month, people are moving, so there will be that inherent churn within the register. There are certain groups that are slower to register than others, which tend to be private renter sector, for instance. Um, we are proactive in actually encouraging registration, so we actually do an annual canvas each year where we will send a form to every household identifying anybody new. We also um, mine uh, databases like the council tax uh, database, schools registers and um, university lists. And anybody we identify who is not on the register, we invite that we issue them an invitation to register. Um, we then follow up with a reminder. And then a third reminder, and we also try and visit the property to, if we can engage with the elector to um, encourage them to register. I think the one thing to note is registration is a voluntary um, exercise within the UK. It's not compulsory. And there will be a certain number of people who, who, who choose not to register. Um, so, but is there any analysis of why that number has fallen? I think if you look over the over the period since 2001, it, it, it's remained relatively constant. It, it hasn't changed significantly. There was a, a, a probably a bigger, if you go back prior to the 1960s, 1990, early 1990s, it was higher. But the law did change in 2001, um, so we we can't do that. Sarah may have some comment on that as well. Yes, certainly. Um it has gone down very slightly since the last time that we did this analysis, and we do this. It's very comprehensive. Uh, piece of research that we do every three years so we can track the state of the registers. Now, it has gone down very slightly since the last time. However, to bear in mind, since 2017, we've had no expected and planned for polls. Obviously, we had the unexpected European Parliament election earlier this year. And we know for the people who are missing from the register, which, as Ian has mentioned, um, the three biggest issues are the length of time you've been at your address. You've been at your address, I think, at less than a year. In Scotland, only about 34% are on the register, where if you've been there for over 10 years, it's something into the 80-90% level. Uh, the second factor is being young, and the third factor is um, tenure. So if you're in private rented accommodation. Um, so you know, you've got cities like Glasgow, where you've got a quite young population, student population, who move frequently, and they tend not to get around to registering at their current address until there is a poll and since 2014 we've had an indi individual electoral registration and that has enabled people to register on time for the first time and that has made a big difference in the run-up to polls with young people i think i remember was it something like 600 thousand yeah, on, the, on the last day of registration ahead of the uh, last uk general there were 622 000 registration applications across um the uk I think it was approaching about 75% of those were people under 34. And I think if you look at those demographics, you look at um, age, you look at tenure, um, you will see that there's an, and uh, private rent sector, the three tend to overlap. The fair chance if you're in private rent sector, you're probably young and you're probably there for less than a year. And it is, there'll be, I wouldn't like to speculate too far as to the reasons for that, but it's connection to the area. Are you going to stay there? How long is your permanency? Do you really see connection? Will you register to vote? Um, but we, what we do see is these people will register, but they register at the last minute. And mm -hmm. Sarah's right, the 2018 registers for when this was done, there was no ele major electoral event in Scotland in that year. Can I say, we do, at the Commission, we do actually think that there is, there is a longer-term problem that does need to be addressed. And that is a lot of the processes around electoral registration are really outdated and could be modernised to make it a lot easier for people to register to vote, even more easy than registering online. And uh, there, it's sort of the annual canvas pro, uh, process that the registration officers have to run is, is very highly prescribed. And Pete and his colleagues will spend a lot of time, lot of time contacting people who they actually know are still at that address mm -hmm. uh, to get them to confirm they're at that address and then going back and back and back. Even though they know from council records that they're there, they still have to get them to confirm. So we're, so there is a some work underway across the UK at the moment, across the three different governments of Wales, um, Scotland and 
in Westminster to try and kind of update that process so that they spend less time on the people who they know to be there, freeing up resource to be going out and find the people that they know aren't there. Um, but we think we can even go further and look at things like if you are, if you've moved house and you're updating your driving licence, can you tick a box that says update my registration details at the same time? I think, I think there are, and I think... Um, I should counter that we're not complacent, as EROs, we're not complacent about, you know, we would like 100% accuracy, 100% completion, that's what we're striving to achieve, and I think these studies are helpful, because um, whilst we, may, we, we would like the figures to sometimes be better, slightly better than they are, at least it gives an indication of where we really need to target our activity. Before Neil comes back, everybody wants a short now. Um, can, can we just have very short contributions from uh, Gil, Gordon and Tom? Yeah. <laughs> what you've just described raises some questions uh, in regards to prisoners, because what you've described uh, is a, a settled uh, group of people who, by and large, stay in one place, or they pass away, or they move house. And I understand the, the register naturally changes about 10%. I think that's the figure every year. But the proposition from the government is for prisoners to be eligible to vote within a year and that would seem to me there's a lot of uh, main, maintenance required in that regard because you've only got that you don't know who they are in advance so you've only got that year to pick them up and put the administration into place so how, how do you think you could you'll be able to cope or how will the system be able to cope with this very changing uh, group of people I think on, on an, every year, the the way the legislation, the, the draft legislation, is framed is that the people the, will be able to remain resident, registered at their home address, um, even though they're detained in prison. So, um, one hopes that they are registered. Um, we will. We've had discussion with the Scottish Prison Service as whether we can identify. The prisoners, we will therefore we discover people are not on the register. Um, that offers opportunities. Um, I think that's one of the challenges about contacting them. But certainly, the way the legislation is framed is that they will be. That hopefully, they won't have to come off the register. One of the concerns would be if you had to take them off their home address, register at the prison for a very short period of time. Because I think one of the challenges is that some of the short sentences could be quite short. It's not just like a year; it could be a short period. So actually, we're, we're, we're quite welcome that fact that they can be remain registered at the home address. Right, okay. that answers that question. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, in evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee, it was highlighted that in 2014, voter registration was at 97%, and currently we're seeing local government uh, register is sitting at 83%. One, can you give us an idea of the number of voters that are not on the register, given that uh, size of drop? And two, what part has uh, the move from household registration to individual registration had on, on that drop? Um, part of the drop will come, come through students. Students are, new, uh, are unique in that they can legitimately register at two addresses, at their term time address mm -hmm. and at their home address. Under the old household registration system, we used to get the full list of everybody resident in student accommodation at, at universities and simply add them onto the register from that information. It is now reliant upon students to register themselves. The anecdotal evidence we're getting is that they prefer to remain registered at their home address because that's where they've got a connection, they understand that. Um, but equally, and so the registration numbers at universities tend to be low. Uh, concerns as we're working with the universities as to how we can promote registration um, but at the end of the day it is voluntary so if the students don't choose to engage um, they may not register so that's that's part of it it is also just a, a a general how much people engage with the electoral events going ahead so certainly my experience at the independence referendum we had people who made quite clear they had never registered to vote before but they felt so strongly about the re uh, independence question that they opted to opt into the registration system so you will get that um, one of the advantages of IR is it's, it's harder for people to come off the register they, they, they can only come off in certain circumstances uh, Chris made a mistake by nodding at uh, some of that would you like to say something Chris as well yeah. well I, th I think uh, the points Pete's making in terms of the actual statistics are, 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 are valid I've not much more to say about the about that element 
I suppose the issue that always comes into this is the, to remember the reason why individual rights legislation was introduced in the first place, which was the integrity of the register. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion about the accuracy, but it's the, uh, the integrity and in making sure that we have the right people on the register, the people on the register, register actually exist, and everyone's registered only once in, in each place. So there's, there's a value to that. Just, um, just very short, um, if you don't mind, Gordon. Cause just, we're just if somebody can answer the, the, yeah. the magnitude of the drop yeah. from 97 to 83%. Um, the 97% never existed. It was, a, I think, from my memory, it was a journalist who had taken the number of people on the register. And it was then Mr Wildman that mentioned it in the Finance and Constitution Committee evidence. I that it was reported as 97%, um, yeah. I think. And, and what happened was just in the run-up to the... Um, intense referendum, as Pete said, we had an unprecedented level of registrations. And the way the system works is when you apply to register to vote, you're placed first placed onto the new register, but you're then taken off the register at your old address. So there's a brief window where you're actually registered twice. So that kind of inflated the figures. Um, and so I'm, I'm not saying it was significantly different, but it certainly wouldn't have been as high as 97%. And then... Um, individual electoral reg registration came in in just immediately. I think it was mm -hmm. introduced the day after the, the referendum, mm -hmm. um, and then so what that did was it cleared the, re the there was a big clear up of the registers essentially, so that you know the double registrations disappeared. So that led to quite a big drop. But when we carried out our completeness and accuracy study in 2015, we found the registers to be significantly more accurate than they had been prior to the referendum the last time we'd done it, which I think was around 2012 or 20, 2011, sorry. So we'd found a big increase in accuracy, but it has, you know, that has dropped mm. a little bit since 2015. Um, Tom, and then we're back to Neil again, please. Yes, um, thank you, Karina. Um, just wondering, in turning the thing on its head, the deregistration, people who have, I mean, the residential thing is now three months. If you're a resident, you, you, you get you proposal to get a vote. When do they, if, if person has been resident in, in, in Scotland and then moves away for work purposes, when do they deregister? Um, my understanding is the bill doesn't introduce any residents um, in terms of residence. That the first day, if you move to Scotland today and a resident, you are eligible to vote to register to vote from today. So the way we we proactively manage the register is, um, as I said, we check other databases. So if we get indication from, say, council tax that somebody's moved out of property, um, uh, that we will then carry out a review of registration. So if we get more than two pieces of evidence to say that somebody's moved, we can just take them off the register. If not, we send them a letter saying, we don't think you're there. If you are, provide evidence. If not, they come off the register. So that active going. The other, th the other backstop to that, if you like, is the Don't annual canvas. No, sorry, apologies for that. Um, the, 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 that actually then um, checks the registration each year. So if, we, if somebody returns the household inquiry form and scores a person off, if we've got another source of evidence, say they're not there, we'll take the people off the register. So that's how it comes in the same way we encourage new people. So in the course of 2018-19, we took about 250,000 people um, added them onto the register and about a similar number came off the register. But when, if, 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 if somebody was resident and did vote, but then moved, moved away to work, London or anywhere else, um, over a period, what period of time can they continue to vote in any, in, in any election? It depends if their main resident, it depends whether they shift their main residence or not. There is a provision that um, if you're away for more than uh, six months, you can, you can still not break your um, residency. There's a provision for if you're working away from home um, that you can remain registered at your home address. So it's at what point they shift their home address. So if you were temporarily working in London for a period of six months, you could remain on the register in Scotland. But if you actually permanently shift to London, then you would have to come off the register in Scotland. By definition, what is a permanent shift? Because a lot of people at the, at the referendum did not get a vote because they were working away from home. My family included in that one. Residence is a, a com complicated. There's no single answer. It's really looking at in the round at all the facts of each individual case as to whether where somebody's main residence is. I think it, 
case law has said it's where the main, your main yeah, business... Yeah, main, bu main business of life is carried out. That's yeah. the case law in Scotland. And where so, is the definition of that? I mean, how, does it, how do you define that? You, do, you don't. You, you, you really just have to look at um, the circumstances. So um, where we are not certain that somebody is resident, we will ask them to provide evidence to us, and if necessary, we'll hold a hearing where they can provide oral evidence to actually outline the facts of their life and how, how what they consider their main residence to be and where the main, main and, business and of their life is. governed by case law in terms of that? I mean, who determines case, case, case law sets out that it's the main business yeah. of life, um, and then it's just interpretation by electoral registration officers. They, if people didn't like our decision, there is a right of appeal um, to the Sheriff Court. From Jamie and then back to Neil after that, please. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Just on the basis of that, I mean, in in, in theory, obviously you can contest it, but in practice, I take it somebody could will will move into an area register, put themselves on the, but then there's no real question, there, there's no real background checks or anything like that, unless unless there is an issue raised with yourselves with regards yeah. to their residence. But there's something that we on our records that indicate there's something not there, and I think the other thing to bear in mind. Are, um, of the 15 EROs, 13 are also assessors, and we hold the we hold the property records, so we can check the size of the property against the number of electors. So if we had a huge number of electors in a small property, we would question that. But but somebody could somebody could you know move up, uh, rent a property, register, and and that wouldn't necessarily be flagged up unless somebody flagged it up. It wouldn't it wouldn't. You have to run a check on the DWP database. You have to provide your national insurance number when you apply right. and the first thing it does is they, they run a match against the DWP database to see if that indicates you are resident there okay. and so if that didn't so then the uh, no DWP just matches your Nina just checks your identity it doesn't check your, your, your residency um, but we do if we get an unsolicited application somebody applies without us inviting them we send a paper communication to the property right. and that acts as a check and certainly i've had a few cases where somebody's come back and said no this person isn't actually registered resident and that's a way of us then reviewing that um, application. i'm not necessarily suggesting whether there's cases of somebody not being you know using a false address i'm just i mean somebody come in for a very short period register and then leave again afterwards and there's no it's unlikely that that would be flagged up flagged up i was just wondering how many cases there are I think that's a very, year. very hard question, and and you can have people genuinely, this is their main residence mm. for three months, yeah, yeah, um, because that they're they're moving around, they don't have a permanent home elsewhere. If this is their permanent home, yeah. even if it's three months, they're entitled to be registered. How many cases are contested every year? I mean, not many, not many, not many. No, no but there's very few cases. Um, we we will if. In the, in the run-up to the independence referendum, there were more. We had more hearings and um, into residency, more more questions over that. Um, but in the normal course, of events not many. And do you I, think they're not being there? Aren't many cases because the process is working, or because we just don't know? I think on the whole, the process is is working because you you've got the annual canvases. There aren't many databases that you do an annual audit of, and the register is done at this annual audit, and that's really important, the annual canvas. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jimmy. And back to Neil and um, Andy and Chris, just five in. For now. Um, <clears throat> in terms of this, the residency um, issue, so it's anyone who just rocks up and says, I'm living here and applies for their vote <coughs> and get the vote. Is that the same? Is that system replicated anywhere else in the UK? It's the same. The residency rules are the same across the. Uh, well, I'm not sure about Northern Ireland, but certainly across Great Britain, the residency rules are the same. Section Section Five. And, and has there been any evidence of um, manipulation of those residency rules? I'm thinking of there are constituencies in Scotland where there are very very small margins between the winning and the losing party. And a couple of busloads of people coming up a couple of weeks before. Uh, we've we've seen in the past them um, manipulation of the electoral system. Um, has there been any evidence of any um, manipulation? Aware of no. Okay. Get, I shall get my cunning plan in place then. <laughs> in the context of that, I'd say that the, the, in elections there's always a tension between integrity and inclusion and making sure as many people take uh, take part as possible, but also that they're, they're doing so according to the rules. Mm -hmm. So we've got to recognise that tension at, at all times. 
after every electoral event, the Electoral Commission complete a, a report on that event, and one of the things that they do look at is is questions of integrity, electoral fraud, and the record in Scotland is, is, is very good. There are very, very few instances ever pulled up of any questions about the delivery of elections in Scotland. Identify something. We report it to the police if we think, and yeah. I've, I've not known a police investigation go to full, full length. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. Um, can I just ask a quick <clears throat> logistical question then, on the back of what you were talking about? Um, with an expansion uh, which could come about um, under this uh, legislation, um, what about polling places? Because, I mean, I know they do change occasionally, but. <laughs> Are they sufficiently, you know, flexible to be able to absorb growth in the numbers locally? The, the polling scheme is a decision of the local authorities. The council has a responsibility in law to identify a polling place, or to split every <coughs> ward into polling districts, and identify a polling place for every district in there. That decision on the polling place, some of it is about accessibility of the building, some of it is about capacity, and some of it is about location. But they'll choose a building that is sufficient for the size of the electorate in that district. Now, that decision will be taken on the basis of the electoral register that were given by the electoral registration officer. If that electorate was to grow as a result of the provisions of this bill, we'd just have to make sure that we've got sufficient capacity in that building um, to, to cope with that number of people. What will often happen is that the number of polling stations may change in a particular event. Well, so that, that's how many stations we have in a particular place in a building. And that might be about, electorate does change from event to event. There are more people that vote and are able to vote in a council election, for example, than in a UK parliamentary election, because the franchise is different. So even between those two events, the electorate changes, and we can cope with that just by looking at the size of the register and what capacity will we need to cope with that. So there may be places in Scotland where we'll find that the register grows significantly in a concentrated area because of these provisions, but that's not insurmountable. That, that will happen in each event in any case. And in terms of staffing, um, that would be handled by the local authority as well, would it? Or? The returning officer is responsible for recruiting and training the staff for each, each electoral event who will work in the polling place. So again... The staffing is driven by the number of polling stations that we'll have for a particular event, and that, that's just a case of do we recruit a couple of extra staff for that building, right. or do we, do we cope with what we've got? And again, that is driven by the numbers on the register. And Andy, that would be, that would be perfectly acceptable in terms of your members, I assume. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree with Chris, um, both in terms of after an election event, you would always review your polling places and how they went and didn't really... Uh, was there any issues around them? So you would review that after every event based on future right. uh, planning. And then in the run-up to the election, to say the number of stations, you would determine that well in advance so you could recruit and uh, you would take factors into case. So if they, let's say the numbers were going up, you would take that uh, part of your decision-making. Uh, and again, uh, planning is a big thing, so timing towards that, knowing these changes in advance of any electoral event uh, is extremely useful to get that right. Okay, and Gil and Jamie, just uh, quite short. Just, just uh, in addition to that, the, the variants that are now going to come into place, the extra <laughs> variants, does that throw any problems in, in, in regard to the administrative the functions of it? It happens between elections at the moment. Um, European elections, we've got a particular franchise. UK parliamentary elections, there's a particular franchise. Scottish Parliament and Scottish local government elections, there's a different franchise. Uh, and we take those when we're training staff, we make sure people are aware of who can and can't vote. Again, we'll take the registers as they're produced by the electoral registration officer and use those as the basis for our planning and delivery. And, and these things do change event by event. OK. Yeah, I think, uh, obviously, you're, you're preparing for that. In a lot of cases, you prepare for um, more than you, you necessarily quite need. So most polling places, for example, take that will have capacity for another station or for taking on an extra two or three hundred uh, things. As I say, there'll be the odd one where you're already at your limit and you'd have to think slightly differently for it, but that would be the minority. And that's probably the same across a number of processes. Uh, you've already got a wee bit of capacity to cope with a bit more. OK, Thank you. thanks for that. Jamie? Thanks very much. I just want to ask a very quick question in regards to if there was uh, the introduction of voter ID or increased um, 
uh, check, checks on voters in polling stations. How might that be impacted by an expansion of the, um, the electorate? I, I think partly that would depend on what type of voter ID you went with. I mean, we there have been trials at local government elections in England both earlier this year and the previous year, and we have a statutory role to evaluate those trials. And each one's used different, each pilot has used different ideas. So some, some follow the model of Northern Ireland where you could apply for a voter ID card if you didn't have, say, a passport or a driving licence. Others have just required you to bring your poll card. Others have required you to bring ID and if you didn't have ID to get somebody to come along to attest that you were who you said you were. So I think if you have new sort of new citizens joining the register, you would need to kind of look carefully at that and so that you don't come up with some kind of ID that would be very difficult for them mm. to obtain. Um, we've said we think there needs to be a bit more thinking around these ID pilots to make sure that they don't... You know, I think it's Chris said earlier, it's that balance, it's that tension between accessibility yeah. and integrity. And we think a bit more... I think you might need to go on to just find that, that right balance in terms of voter ID. Okay. I think, I think um, you have a point. Well, sorry, yeah, the, the other point at the moment is that the intention is uh, it's only the UK government that's intended to introduce it for UK <laughs> parliamentary elections mm. and uh, foreign nationals would not be enfranchised as it stands for those elections. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I, there's another very quick point as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I was just going to ask, obviously, there's, there, there, I, th I think I'm right in saying there's an increase in um, people voting by post, using postal votes. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the security of, of the voting process and the um, eligibility, is, do, is that harder to do, essentially, when it's postal voting than somebody coming in, or is there no real difference at the moment um, between somebody going into a polling station? In many ways, I'd say the, the integrity checks that apply to postal voters are, are greater than those that apply to people that turn up in, in person to vote uh, at a polling place. Um, you'd be aware that for every everyone that applies for a postal vote needs to fill in a postal application yeah. in which they provide the signature and date of birth. Every postal vote that, that is returned, the signature and the date of birth are checked before that ballot paper is actually opened and placed into the count. So th those checks are much more, in some ways, rigorous um, than someone turning up at a polling place and just declaring their name and address. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to check those those voter ID elements before that that is processed. Okay. Yeah. And if somebody's signature doesn't match at uh, an election, the electoral registration officer will write out saying your signature didn't match, and you need to provide a new one. And if they don't provide, we can take them off the absent voter list. So the gap at the moment is in is in the, the polling stations, effectively. That, 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 yeah, there is a difference between polling station there is, and, yeah. and um, postal vote, yeah. When someone is actually affirming their name and address in a polling place, they're, they're making a solemn declaration of their identity. And it's the same way that we, we trust them in, in doing that. A lot of elections, are, electoral elements are, are based on, on trust. Yeah. Someone says, my name is, this is where I live. We take that as their solemn oath of who they are. Okay, thank you. Um, right, even quicker, short yeah, question from Gil. Harry, I'm just looking at some of the questions that I was going to ask anyway. I'm just wondering, how does how what you just described carry forward for prisoners in their situation? in regards to postal votes or proxy votes. Is there any additional problems for your administration? Not, not for prisoners, I can see it's quite straightforward for them, but the administrative process, is that a problem? Within our evidence we've submitted, we've, we've highlighted that the, the expansion of the franchise is one thing, but the very fact that a prisoner is not at liberty would potentially limit the, the degree to which the normal rules could apply to them. Um, so, for example, if someone doesn't receive a postal vote at the moment, a postal vote is lost or, or it doesn't arrive, um, that can be replaced, but it would generally um, require the person to come up and show some form of identification and ask for it. Or if it's spoilt, uh, again, they are asked to, come to return the spoilt papers and then we'll reissue them. Some of these things are very difficult to apply if someone's not at liberty. So the, the basic level, it will be the same. They'll get a postal vote, they'll sign it, they'll put the date of birth, they'll send it back, and it will be processed as normal. And, and proxy? What about the proxy for uh, voting? Is there a, I think is it's a problem a, there? No, I think they need to complete a proxy vote application form, and I think one of the challenges will be the, the speed with which we can communicate. So if an ordinary elector 
um, makes a mistake on their proxy vote application or the registration application, we can pick up the phone, we can send them an email, um, and it, you can get a fairly quick response, or indeed, if necessary, we can go out and visit them if, it, if in certain circumstances. With prisoners, that will be more, more difficult, and I think that's, that will be the challenge. Right, okay. Mark leads us into questions um, which Mark here has. Um, Mark, would you get to go? Yeah, I mean, maybe just to build on, on that theme, Chris, in your, in your evidence, you said that the extension of the franchise is necessary but not sufficient to allow some prisoners to vote and that barriers would remain. I mean, I think you've just described perhaps one of the, the issues there. Are, are there others that the, the panel wish to comment on in relation to what those barriers are? I think one that will need to be looked at is if, if you're giving somebody the vote, they need to be able to given the, the opportunity to inform what choice they're going to make. Mm. So I think, as I understand it, you know, there is not no unlimited internet access. Um, so I think that's going to have to be thought through about how somebody can actually inform themselves, particularly if it's a, an election where, where they, they want to look at the candidate policies rather than, you know, you can put every party's manifesto in front of them, but they might want to know about their particular candidate. Add to the, the post of what, yeah, the replacement. It's also the timing, because uh, currently uh, <coughs> electors can uh, go up to the polling station and hand deliver it right up to that last minute, uh, uh, sort of one minute to ten. Obviously, prisoners won't be able to do that. Everything will have to be posted back and forward. So actually, their time scales uh, for dealing with the postal vote will be uh, shortened uh, to, to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, also the, the fact that um, it's not just local, uh, whereas at the minute all your, uh, your postal voters are local to to the returning officer in the prison it could actually be in the prison in Stirling for example but actually from Aberdeen so mm. it's, it's even more difficult there's, there's no way you can travel down to, mm. to, to do that even if you could go in and visit them in the prison yeah 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 well I think as we say there that the the expansion of the franchise allows people to vote we just have to accept that they don't have the same ability and the same freedom that a normal voter at liberty in the community would have so therefore some of these um, restrictions will exist on them that wouldn't exist on other people. Mm -hmm. Also mentioned here just some of the basic rules of, d of democracy that people have got a hard one, hard won right to vote in in secret, so people don't know how you're casting your vote. So we may need to think about that to make people vote in secret so that they're free from coercion, free from influence. No one's telling them how to vote or rewarding them for it in a, in a particular way. We just have to make think about creative ways how that can happen, how people can vote in secret in a in a prison. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the, the some of those issues that flow from that. Okay. And in terms of these um, the, the, these kind of questions, I mean, has there been discussion with Scottish government officials, drafting the bill, ministers, nodding? Yeah. Okay. With Scottish government and with Scottish Prison Service, um, and I think any I think electoral registration officers are more than happy to engage with any stakeholders to look at how we can, maybe not to make the process entirely as smooth as, as for ordinary electors, but we can certainly um, look at ways of minimising and mitigating any issues that can arise. Also, it's also seen that the extension of the franchise in this way is potentially an opportunity for education and rehabilitation uh, for prisoners, that they, they see the, the, the lessons and the, the, the openness about voting as part of a, a process for um, giving them a broader um, explanation of, of life in an open society. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and are there particular challenges with prisoners sh um, serving short sentences um, in terms of, you know, when election is called and some of those administrative issues? I think the issue is the same as any election, it's who is on the register. So what, once someone is, is on the register, the election will be processed as normal and administered in that way. So the question is then about getting them on the register and making sure the postal vote goes to the right address or that the proxy, they're able to vote by proxy. Okay. So. And if they were to be released after the date of um, changing post votes, they adopted to vote by post and then were released, they would still be committed to vote by post. And I think we'd have to look at, um, probably Chris can comment more accurately on how you would actually ensure that their postal vote reached them. Okay. Some other change in address would We'd make a replacement postal vote, cancel the old one, and, and issue a new one to the new address. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what about um, prisons from Scotland that are in English prisons? Is that does that cause a, a complexity around around that? It will require us to work. With, we've yet to engage with uh, the HM Prison Service south of the border, and we will need to do so just to um, establish that we can verify that they're serving sentence for less than twelve months. 
Okay, and just final questions moving on from prisoners. Um, I mean, what about asylum seekers um, and the potential to extend the franchise to asylum seekers in this country? Does that, does that pose particular challenges? Are those insurmountable? How would, how would we go about that? I mean, in terms of reaching them, encourage them to register mm -hmm. and understand how to vote. Yeah, yeah and the commission and would potentially take to a, be candidates as well. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, and that the commission would take a lead on that kind of awareness raising nationally. But we would work very closely in partnership with the registration officers across Scotland, who've got the kind of links into their particular communities. But I think it would be very much a partnership approach because we could run a grand advertising campaign, but we're trying to reach. 55, potentially 60,000 people mm -hmm. who are dotted around the country. Um, so it wouldn't be very cost effective to be running, you know, nationwide big advertising. So I think, you know, I, I watched with interest the um, evidence you had, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've spoken to Lorna from the Refugee Council since, talking about how we can work together to, because these people are already on the ground working out with these communities. So there's no point us trying to replicate the good work they're doing. So we can work in partnership. What we've done in the past is developed education resources mm -hmm. which look at not just how you register and how you vote but also you know what is an elected politician what do parties mean mm -hmm. um, this is work we're looking at anyway to do with political political literacy in schools to, to be reaching um 16 17 year olds um in the past we had a big resource that you know, registration officers used as well and um, youth workers which was called the democracy cookbook which are plain english information about the institutions mm -hmm. and then um activities such as build your own politicians sort or of fun activities where people could think about democracy and what it means mm -hmm. so i think we'd be looking at sort of developing some of that work <coughs> for young people and i think you can kind of maybe transfer that um, to different audiences, you know, just by using mm -hmm. different examples and different issues to put mm -hmm. in. Um, but I, like I say, I think it'd be very much a partnership approach on this because we'll be relying on the expertise and knowledge of people who do this work. We, we can bring the expertise on democracy and voting, but we need the expertise on people who work in these communities and understand the needs, language barriers. Mm -hmm. we, we already translate our forms into about 25 different languages, but that might change. I've been looking at... Some of the, the census data from 2011, it does look like the biggest group that will be enfranchised will be Americans, um, but there will also be large numbers of Iraqis, um, Chinese. So we need to be thinking about um, probably more translated materials as well. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> just um, the annual canvas of electors, um, obviously in 2020, there's one of the annual canvases. Um, and that would relate strongly, as far as we're concerned, to the 2021 elections for this place. Um, but what if um, there were another referendum to take place in Scotland prior to 2021? Would that electoral canvas be up, and up to the mark and prepared for that? Um, or would that require extra work to be carried out? annual canvas is something we do uh, obviously by its definition every year um, it follows a, a it's very heavily prescribed at the moment um, we have to issue a household inquiry form to every residential property in our area um, we then have to issue a second form and uh, if we don't get response we have to visit the property to get a response and if we don't get response issue a third form so it's a, it, it's actually a robust procedure it works it works well um, if you look back to the independence referendum in 2014, um, the referendum was on the 18th of September. By July, my team were already working overtime. Um, in a, to a certain extent, these electoral events drive registration of their own accord. The annual canvas supplements it and, and, and uh, reinforces it, but the two work hand in hand. I think we will need to be the 2020 canvas will need to make sure um, that the messaging is clear that franchise has been extended if the legislation is passed. The other thing to note is the UK, and as Sarah's alluded to, the UK and Scottish governments are looking at canvas reform, which means that for pro people where we don't think there are properties where we don't think there has been a change, we will send a light touch communication um, and we will need to make sure that that communication makes clear that anybody not registered who is now eligible can now register. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask something? Um, I'll come back. Uh, can I just ask a 
about the percentages that we talked about earlier who are registered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and obviously, there are a number of factors which cause people to f not be on, either not be on or fall off um, the electoral register. Um, we did also talk about education. In, in terms of education of the general population, um, how much is there of that or plans for it going forward? Well, the, the Commission runs a public awareness campaign ahead of every major electoral event. Um, so currently, you know, the next one we would have planned in Scotland would be in the run-up to the Scottish Parliament election. We found that running sort of year-round activity... Um, which, what we, when we started as commission, which is over 10 years ago, we kind of ran year-round activity, and we found it wasn't terribly effective because unless there's a, a something dangling right in front of people, they tend not to take action. So saying, you know, in a year's time, there is an election, so you must register now, doesn't seem to work. But when you have messaging which says you have 10 days left to register, that's when we kind of get a really good return on our money. So there is... Um, you know, so there is that element, and that's you know, kind of factual information about how you register, how you vote, how you get a postal vote. There is other work we're looking at at the moment, which is um, we've been talking to the Australian Electoral Commission that's been, and they've been looking at, um, they ran a campaign going Know the Source, which ran alongside their voter awareness campaign, which was encouraging voters to look at the messaging that was targeting them at elections and actually check what the source of it was. Um, so that's a piece of work that we're looking at as, as, as running at, at future elections as well mm. for the general public. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um, sort of I remember, some people say I don't really remember, but I remember being at school and um, elections weren't something that we ever talked about at that time, I ha have to say, because it was 21 you had to be to vote at that time. Um, but when you, got, when you get the vote at 16 or 18, um, there's obviously more of an impetus behind the idea of getting people uh, registered, etc. And is there much work actually done through schools then? Yeah. Uh -huh. We've been working with Education Scotland mm -hmm. and um, various other bodies, um, the Association of Directors of, of Education. Um, we've been doing it since, I think it was just before the uh, independence referendum, right. because what we were finding was teachers across the country were all using different approaches some people thought they could talk about the referendum, others thought that they weren't allowed to talk about it in school. Um, so we all came together and we did a kind of a, a, a briefing <coughs> for head teachers and teachers to sort of say, well, this is appropriate, this wouldn't be appropriate, just to kind of reassure them it's okay to do it. Um, so I think there was a bit of nervous, nervousness around in 2014 because it was quite a highly charged atmosphere. But since the, the young people have had the vote permanently from 16 for Scottish elections, it's been a much more kind of relaxed attitude. We ran campaigns in 2016 and 2017 ahead of the elections, um, specifically targeting um, young people in schools. And the campaign was called Ready to Vote, and it encouraged schools to run an, um, a registration event mm -hmm. in their schools in the month of March in both years. Um, and then in 2017, I think 84% of secondary schools signed up to do, a, to do this registration activity with the young people who would be old enough to register and vote at that election. Because the great thing about 16-year-olds, as opposed to 18-year-olds, is we know where most of them are, mm -hmm. and we can reach them. And this is work we're going to be building on, um, running up to the 2021 20, Scottish Parliament election. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, the financial memorandum is obviously something which um, excites people potentially more than, than it needs. Um, but uh, would anyone look here to bring the financial memorandum in? Uh, so if not, then I will, and you may join in when, when it suits you. <laughs> but, <clears throat> um, the financial memorandum allocates £280,000 one-off payment to the Electoral Commission um, for the purpose of publicity, guidance, etc. Um, now that we're told, £200,000 would be an appropriate estimate for the additional public awareness costs of the 2021 election, um, giving us the first one planned using them. Are these resources identified in the financial memorandum sufficient to support the necessary work for newly enfranchised voters? That that is some is there largely for work taking place around the annual canvas. Um, we have a separate budget which sits outside of that financial memorandum of usually around 1.5 million to run a public awareness campaign ahead of the poll, which will kick in in 2021. So that would just be 
for work that will take place up until our main public awareness campaign runs in 2021, which will also include elements for new voters. As I read it as well, the £200,000 has been a, a, um, allowed in the financial memorandum to local authorities for the work that they'll be doing around the expansion of the franchise. And I think the way the financial memorandum phrases it is that that's small enough when it's spread across those two authorities not really to matter. Um, or it, it's such that no additional funding would be required because 200,000 spread across those two authorities isn't very much and we'll be able to cope with that. I think in terms of the, the work of local authorities, we'd say that 200,000 is still 200,000 pound and it's something when, that we'd have to cope with given the other pressures that, that local authorities have to deal with at the moment. And an additional 200,000 is still more money that, that comes away from other services. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, okay, and Neil, yes. Hey, Chris, it's Edinburgh Council you, you, you're from. Um, I'm just wondering, I was speaking to um, some local authority people recently who were saying that in terms of their um, youth work, they used to have, I think it was around 40 or 50 staff. They now have eight. eight. Um, they were the people who went out and engaged young people and got them on the register and did the democracy uh, workshops and all that kind of stuff. Do you know in terms of Edinburgh, for example, um, what capacity do you have for that kind of outreach work? That sort of outreach work isn't just done by community education workers. I think it, it's done across the council. So as, as Sarah said, a lot of this goes on through schools mm -hmm. at the moment. So it's part of the curriculum in schools at the moment to make sure people are aware of the franchise and aware of the nature of the electoral events they'll be participating in. Even though there may be fewer community education workers than there the used to be, um, we still think there's an adequate provision right across the council um, through a lot of different outreach methods. It's not just within schools either. And we do work at citizenship events. We've got the electoral registration officers also have staff that are involved in, in engagement with, with communities. And we'll go out specifically to events right across the community, um, black, minority, black minority ethnic community events. So there's a, a lot of engagement with, um, again, citizenship ceremonies, EROs will be there making sure that people have got the relevant forms and understand what they've got to do. So while there may be fewer um, specific outreach workers like that, it's something that's spread across all that councils do. I've said my own area. I've been partnership working with the three education authorities. Um, Sarah alluded to the um, toolkit that the Electoral Commission provides. That's been really effective. Um, it would be good to see that not just in election years, but non-election years as well. Um, and I think the other thing to note is that we do get lists from the schools of all eligible pupils. And if those pupils haven't registered themselves, we will, we will personally write to them, inviting them to register. So it, it is a multi-strand approach. So it isn't just education authorities. It isn't just EROs. It isn't just the Electoral Commission. There's a huge body for work. And you know, if there are community groups out there promoting registration, that, that is a good thing. That, that politicians also have a responsibility to make sure that people are aware of the, their responsibilities. So we often look at you as stakeholders in the electoral events as well. So you'll be knocking on doors, canvassing people, and, and that's an opportunity as well to make sure that people are on the register and know what they've got to do to take part. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, just a quick... Yeah, I mean, just, just to finish off, um, I wondered if you had any more thoughts or comments on the extension of candidacy rights... The, the actual practicalities of it, like, as a policy measure, that's for you. We'll mm -hmm. apply the rules uh, as they're given. In terms of candidacy rights, when someone fills in a nomination form, we take what they put on the nomination form on faith. We, we don't check that that's their address. We don't check that that's their name. We don't check that's their citizenship. If that's wrong, they've provided false information and they can be, be held to account for that. So we would just we don't go beyond the four four corners of the ballot of the the, the nomination paper. So we'd do the same um, in terms of a, a candidate, whoever they are, whatever their their qualification is. We take on good faith what they've told us. If that proves to be wrong, um, they'd have to answer for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just just quickly, I fully agree with Chris on that. Um, however, you do get questions in the nomination process, so clear guidance so or clear areas where the, the potential candidates can go and and check for themselves, mm -hmm. um, it would be useful to make that process smoother for, for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Right, well, any other final question? Uh, yes, Gil. Just a quick one on uh, security uh, I, and I, in regards to 
the administrative process, say, within a prison. Are you, are you, is there any issues in that regard, uh, both uh, security and secrecy? I think we're working with the prison services to make sure that any communication we send goes to the correct prisoner, and we're exploring options around how we can make sure that that happens. And I think there are uh, every prisoner has a number allocated to them, so that may form part of the communication to make sure that we're getting the right communication to the right prisoner. Okay. I just think in terms of secrecy, I think what we'd want to discuss with the prison services is making sure that when voters do. Uh, prisoners do come to vote that they have a private secure area where they can fill in their vote independently and without any un undue influence mm. yeah. okay yeah. Fine, that's uh, okay great fine. thanks very much and thank you i mean um you've taken everything that we've given you and you've given us uh, very strong answers <clears throat> um so thank you all very much indeed today we may be in touch with you again at some future point as we run through um but andy hunter sarah mackie um, Chris Highcock and Peter Wildman, thank you all very much indeed. And uh, I'll let you go now. <laughs> thank you. And uh, that ends the public part of this meeting. So if we could clear the gallery, please. Thank you. And anyone else? <laughs>